Three from Daniel Harlow. <coughs> All right, hi. Um, so actually, before I talk about physics, I want to make it a, a different a, a different suggestion. I guess I said this to some people at breakfast already, but you know how like the lectures end at five, and then it's kind of too early for dinner. Um, so there's this beautiful green field right out there. So someone should get a soccer ball or a frisbee, and uh, that's what you should do in that hour. I think we did that basically every day for a month uh, when I was a student at Tussie. All right, so get on that. Um, <laughs> okay, and, and if you do it this week, I'll play. Uh, all right, um, so uh, yesterday uh, we uh, started uh, talking about this idea of uh, reconstruction. Uh, where the idea is we, we want to take some bulk field, uh, so phi of x, and we want to represent it in the CFT, if you like, as sort of phi CFT of x. So we want an operator representation of fields in the center of the bulk or anywhere else in the bulk uh, as operators acting on the Hilbert space of the CFT. Uh, and we saw that um, for a free scalar in ADS, uh, which if you like, you can think of as being the sort of the leading order in 1 over n piece of the story where you include gravity, um, we found uh, a representation where we wrote phi of little x is equal to an integral over phi of big x, the boundary, and then there was this kernel, k of little x, big x, o of big x, um, where, uh, you know, if x was here, um, oh, I'm going to run out of points, but okay. Yeah. Um, then we were then then this boundary integral was being done over this region I called d sub little x, which was the set of points in the boundary which are space-like separated to x. Um, and if you remember the the way that we derived this was by solving the bulk equation of motion, just the free scalar wave equation for phi. Um, with boundary conditions that were given by this extrapolate dictionary, which says that if we take um, phi to infinity, uh, r, t, and omega, uh, then we got O of t and omega. Um, so the O appearing here is the O which is dual to phi. Um, so um, the first time I drive this, I went through this story of going to momentum space and then going back to position space because that makes it a little bit easier to drive this. But you could also just formally try to do this by saying you just want to find a function k which has two properties. You want it to have the property that if you act on the first argument, which is a bulk point, with the, with the Klein-Gordon operator, del squared minus m squared, um, on k you get zero, right? So that, that ensures that whatever is on the left-hand side here is going to obey the equation of motion in little x. Uh, and then you also want k to have the property that if, if little x approaches the boundary, 
then it becomes a delta function and wherever it goes with big O of x times this r to the delta. So then it just, re it just re this equation reduces um, to this equation, right? So we could have also started that way, you know, just, just tried to find a function k with those properties. Um, so that way of thinking about it um, is a little bit easier to generalize to including interactions, which as I said yesterday, we're clearly going to want to do. Otherwise, this is sort of just too kinematic to be interesting. Yes? Some question. Could you remind me why we don't include any points that are in causal contact with our point of interest? Um, no, that's not a dumb question at all. I mean, that was just a choice. So it wasn't a priori clear that, that we would be able to do that. It just, it, it so happened that we were able to construct a K that had that property. Uh, yeah, I think the discussion today hopefully will make it a little bit more clear about why we were able to do that. Uh, I'm just wondering about like, what other conditions are trying to specify that are now going to be specified. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I'm gonna, so I'm gonna build in as a principle that I want it to only be things that are space-like separated. Um, but, but I mean, a priori, there's no particularly good reason to do that. It's just that that's. It turns out that we can do that, and then it makes things nicer. So, um, all right. Um, so uh, I'm going to now extend this story to interactions. Uh, so the basic idea is that we're going to begin by introducing a space-like um, bulk Green's function. I guess in principle it should be a Green function, but I, I, ne I never know. Anyways, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. Well, I, guess, I guess it's conventional to do this, but it's not, it's not a Bessel's function, so I don't know why it's a Green's function, but anyway. <laughs> um, so, okay, so, so what do I mean by a space-like Green's function? So I mean um, a function that depends on two bulk points, um, x and x prime, and it has the property that if I act on it with the primed, Klein-Gordon operator, so this is the derivative with respect to x prime squared. Um, then I get, uh, well, since since we might be in Kerr space, uh, one over square root of minus g, delta d plus one, uh, x minus x prime. So I get a delta function. So okay, so that's that's the definition of a Green's function. So so far, it's just a Green's function. But then space-like, what that means is that um, uh, g of x and x prime uh, equals zero unless um, x, x prime are uh, space-like separated. Um, so, so this is a bit of a weird Green's function to think about. Um, you know, usually when we think about Green's functions, we want them maybe to be zero at space-like separation, and then at time-like separation, right, they tell you how the, you know, the solution of the wave equation evolves, right? So that's a little bit weird. But I mean, the reason why I, I do that is because, you know, we're kind of solving the, wave, the, the equation in the wrong direction, right? We're starting, we're starting at the edges and moving in, right? So it's a sort of non-standard Cauchy problem. Uh, and there are actually many interesting mathematical consequences of that, which we probably won't have time to get into. Uh, for the most part. Um, but anyway, so, so fine, I say I want one of these, but you might say, okay, but how do you know that you have one of these, right? Like in, you know, when you're doing causal evolution, you know, that, you know, you're solving, well, I never remember whether it's hyperbolic or elliptic PDEs, but it's the good one. The, the one that's uh, Lorenzian time evolution, then you can prove that you always have these things. But, but going this way, it's sort of neither hyperbolic nor elliptic. Again, I never remember which is which. Uh, so, so I need to give you some sort of argument that a G like this actually exists. Um, so in ADS, I can give you, there's kind of a sneaky argument that this G exists. You can also try to construct it explicitly, but I'm just going to give you the sneaky argument. So the sneaky argument is um, take the point X and put it in the center of the space, OK? So now the rotational symmetry then reduces this solving, constructing this to a two-dimensional problem. Right, because the, the angular dimensions are gone, you just have T and R. But once it's, you've reduced it to a two-dimensional problem, well, there's no real difference between the time and the space direction. You can just view the space direction as the time and the time as the space and then work in the wrong metric sign convention. Uh, so then when one of the points is in the center, this thing has to exist. 
Okay? And, but then once it exists, when one of the points is in the center, now we can use the conformal symmetry to move it around, and now it, it has to exist for arbitrary choice of the two points. All right. So, okay, that, that may be able to sound a little sneaky, but I think it's a rigorous argument, at least in ADS. Uh, yeah? Sorry, how, how is the logic you've changed time and space and then you do this? <coughs> well, so in, in two dimensions, right, like if you write down the metric um, ds squared equals minus dt squared plus dx squared, um, which one is time and which one is space? Well, I guess the way I wrote it, it makes it look like this is time and this is space. But I could just say, oh, no, I'm, I'm working in the stupid particle physics sign convention. And actually, this is space and this is time. And you can't stop me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Was there another question? Yeah. Well, no, I just, first, I just choose. So, so I'm, I'm trying to do this in ADS, in, in pure ADS. So, I, so it's a function of two points. So I, first, I just pick one of the points to be in the center. You can't stop me from doing that. And then, so then I'm going to construct this when one of the points is in the center. Okay? And then this thing I said is true, because the symmetry eliminates the rest of the directions. Now, once I've done that, then I just use the conformal symmetry to, to move the points around, and then I've therefore constructed it everywhere. Because acting with the conformal symmetry won't change the fact that it's a solution to this equation. Yeah? Uh, sorry, what? It doesn't? No, it doesn't. This is this is symmetric in these two. Sorry. Oh, oh you mean you mean because of the? Oh, yeah, yeah. But I, I mean, I can put a minus sign and then uh, fix that, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah, maybe. No, no, no. Because uh, think about it from the Green's function point of view, right? The source can have either sign. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's just changing the definition of the charge by a sign. Um, okay. Um, uh, th those are quantum mechanical words. I, I'm just solving this classical equation. It's neither of those. I mean, it, it, if you want to think about it that way, it's neither of those. It's a space like Green's function. So it's not the Feynman Green's function. It's not the advanced Green's function. It's not the, re the retarded one. It's a different one. It's, it, it's none of them. That's what I'm saying. Because th those, none of those are space-like, right? This is space-like. Those are all causal, right? So, I mean, I, I guess, yeah, so, I mean, so the signal propagates inside the, the light cone in the future, or maybe to the past, depending which, or maybe both, depending which combination of them you pick. But, but it's actually zero outside the light cone, usually. Well, that depends. So the commutator is zero outside the light cone, sorry. But, but those are non-zero inside the light cone inside the, the time-like light cone. So, so yeah, I mean, it, sometimes you can think of this as some combination of those, but in general, you can't. Maybe I should comment on that. So in the definition here, I'm not insisting that it's symmetric between exchange and x and x prime. And in general, it won't be. And for example, those always are. So I'm never going to be able to make this out of those. All right, yeah? No, I can't. And I think that that's a very interesting mathematical problem. Yeah. 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 In fact, we'll, we'll see in general, actually, that these things, I mean, so in, in, uh, in, in pure ADS, this thing exists as a function. We can write it down. But in other uh, space, in, uh, for example, like in other, like the Rindler reconstruction we're going to do later, it's, it exists only distributionally. So it's kind of not really a function. So the mathematics gets quite subtle, actually, in general, when thinking about these things. They're sort of w more distributional than the usual Gris functions. All right. So, but actually, in this lecture, we're never going to actually need to write down this function. We're just going to use its properties. Uh, and then that's going to be you know, the properties we've already stated. And that's going to be good enough to, to run this story to all orders in perturbation theory. Yeah. Back in the early days of ADS DFT, we worked with bulk to boundary green functions. Is this essentially the same? Or is uh, yeah, let me comment on that. So, this is not the bulk to boundary propagator. Mm -hmm. And this is not the time ordered bulk greens function. Yeah. 
Yeah, in fact, this one, for example, might, so for example, the bulk to boundary propagator, so the, the bulk to boundary propagator you get by taking the bulk to bulk propagator and moving a point to the, to the edge. So, so that's not what this is. You'll see, you'll see what happens when we move one of these to the edge later, but it's not going to be that. Yeah. Um, okay, um, good. So now um, let's first observe that phi of little x, um, well, we can write it as integral dd plus 1 x um, square root of minus g, um, I guess I'm writing this, uh, del prime squared um, minus m squared uh, g uh, of x, x prime, phi of x prime. Okay, hopefully no one's going to fight with that. I just take this, I act here, I get the delta function, it does the integral, I'm back to where I started. Um, but now um, I can, uh, instead of doing that, I can do integration by parts on this, uh, 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 on these derivatives here. So, so, so this, is, this is like the, the Jackson part of the lectures. Um, so, uh, so when I integrate by parts, I, using the fact that the, the Green's function is space-like, um, the, uh, the, the terms that I get are going to only depend on the parts where, uh, where, you know, where the, the x primes, which are space-like, separated to x here. Okay, remember, x is fixed on this side. Um, so uh, what I get is I get an integral over this dx, which we defined before. Um, we get a, so now it's ddx square root of minus gamma, where this is the induced metric um, on the boundary. Um, then, uh, well, so we're just doing Stokes' theorem. So then there's going to be the radial normal vector here, r mu, contracted with d prime mu g uh, minus g d prime mu phi. Um, and then move this up. Um, and then there will be a, the remaining term, um, which looks like dd plus 1 uh, x prime. Uh, this is x prime also. Um, uh, square root of minus g of x prime. Uh, g of x, x prime. And now we get the Klein-Gordon operator acting on the, f on the field um, uh, instead of on the Green's function. So I did two integrations by parts here because I had to move two derivatives over. And then I picked up two boundary terms when I did it. Now, um, I can simplify this by using the asymptotic forms of phi and g. The boundary term I can simplify. Right. Um, so, so phi of x. Well, we we already know what phi of x does, right? As 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 r goes to infinity, um, it just becomes r to the minus delta times o of big X. Okay. Um, G um, in the in the limit that r prime goes to infinity. Well, what does it do? So we know that, um, so since, since, in, since x is sitting somewhere in the bulk, right, then, then the g of x and x prime is a function of x prime. Uh, near the boundary is just going to obey the, the scalar wave equation in ADS that we discussed before. So it means that it's going to have these two asymptotic uh, uh, falloffs. Um, so there will be, a, so I, I'm going to choose a normalization convention. I'm going to put a two, to 2 delta minus d here, where remember uh, delta was this d over 2 plus 1 half square root of d squared plus 4m squared. It was the dimension of the dual operator. Um, and now there will be two parts. So there will be a part which goes like r to the minus delta um, times some function which depends on little x and also on big x prime. Uh, and then there will be a part, oh, this is an r prime, sorry. And then there will be a part that goes like r prime to the uh, minus d minus delta. 
So d minus delta is just flipping the sign here. So that's the other asymptotic fall off that we found in the first lecture. Um, times some function k of little x big X prime. Okay, so, so again, this is just using the fact that, that, that this guy obeys the wave equation in a X prime and then using the asymptotic uh, form of the solution. Uh, and then what, it, what this L and what this K are will be determined by the actual choice of the space like Green's function. Yeah. K is not K. It is. You'll see in a moment. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, it's not an accident. You're so impatient. <laughs> Um, okay, so now, now we can substitute these asymptotic forms into this equation and simplify the boundary terms. Um, so what we find is this tells us that phi of little x um, is equal to uh, the integral over Rx, this boundary region, which is space-like separated, um, then dd x prime, and now we get um, what I'll call GCFT of X prime. Uh, so this is, this is big X prime. Um, so GCFT is related to the induced metric on the boundary by a factor of R squared. Because remember, the, the ADS metric was um, DT squared times 1 plus R squared uh, plus DR squared over 1 plus R squared. Uh, plus r squared d omega squared. So you see the, the induced metric on a surface of large r actually blows up. There's this r squared here and this r squared there, right? So remember, it's conformally equivalent to dt squared plus, uh, minus dt squared plus d omega squared. So, so the difference between this GCFT and this, and this induced metric here is just this factor of r squared. So, so th this is going to be the thing that actually makes sense in the CFT. Um, okay, good. Uh, so then, um, now, uh, and again, I'm sorry I won't do the details, but you can, you can check this in your dorm, um, that we just get the boundary terms just become this. So, so it becomes the same kind of formula that we had before with k of x defined here. Um, but then now there's also this bulk term, so let's, let's write that again, um, plus integral dd plus 1 x prime square root of minus g of x prime uh, g d prime squared minus m squared uh, phi of x prime. Okay? So now we already see something nice, which is that if we go to the free case, where we just say that phi obeys the free wave equation, then we're in good shape. Because, hey, look, here's the free wave equation. So this term is 0. And we've just recovered the formula that we wrote before, uh, but from this more formal uh, point of view, working in position space. Um, but now we can say, OK, but what if it's not a free, free uh, theory? What if, what if instead of this being 0, it's equal you know, to some higher power in phi or something? right? So there's some nonlinear interactions. So in particular, say that, um, just, to, just to be concrete, right? say, that, say that we have uh, you know, the, the Lagrangian minus d phi squared plus g over 3n uh, phi cubed. So it's the simplest possible interaction, a cubic scalar interaction in the bulk. Um, well, then the equation of motion, I guess I should put a minus sign here. Oh, well, this, yeah, the, so let's see. The equation of motion, oh, God, well, the sign, I'll, do I have to work this out? Um, Yeah, I think, okay, I think this will end up being equal to, with the plus sign, um, g over n phi squared. Okay, I hope I got the sign right. You, you can tell me in 10 seconds if I did. Um, uh, so, so once we make that substitution, you see we're, we're in pretty good shape. Because now we have an equation for phi here, uh, and then we have phi squared there. But what we can do is we can do this usual trick that you learn in quantum mechanics, which is we can take the, the right-hand side of this equation, which gives us an expression for phi, and then we can iterate the equation. So we can take that right-hand side of the equation, and we can substitute it in here for phi squared. And you see that when we do that, we'll, so this term will stay, but then by sticking this term into here, we'll generate a term which is of order 1 over n. 
and then there will be a, a higher order, then there will be another term, which, which is, again will be a boundary integral, and then there will be a term which is a, which is a higher, order, higher order term. So, so let me just write out the do, the, do that once, so that we can see what the formula looks like. Um, um, so, okay, so, so, so at leading order in 1 over n, and so remember yesterday we discussed theories where all the interactions are suppressed by 1 over n, so that's why I put an n here, okay, just so that we're, there's only one expansion parameter we have to worry about. Otherwise, we'd have to do a multiple expansion and 1 over lambda and 1 over n and whatever other couplings are around in the bulk. So, um, okay, but anyway, so, so doing the first iteration, what we find is that phi of little x is equal to the following thing. So we have this integral k o term that we just wrote down, so I won't write out the details of it again. Um, and then now we get a correction which is proportional to g over n, integral um, dx prime, square root of minus g cft, x prime, uh, dx double prime, square root of minus g cft of x double prime. And then we have an integral over a bulk point, um, so, so uh, d, uh, little x prime, so may I'll try to be careful about doing these things. Um, so then this will be square root of minus g. Uh, and then now we get, okay, so what do we get? So since we, what we get is we take, we basically we're sort of squaring this term and sticking it here and then integrating it against this g, right? So the integral against the g gives you this integral. Uh, and then the two integrals here are, are, are these two integrals. So then there will be two k's. So we get a, a k of um, a little x prime, big x prime. We get a k of little x prime, big x double prime. Uh, we get a g of little x, little x prime. And then we get O of X, O of big X, um, I guess prime, uh, O of big X uh, double prime. Uh, so, um, yeah, maybe I'll push this up here so that you can stare at it and move over to the next board. Um, okay, so that, that maybe doesn't look too illuminating, but if you think about it, there's a nice diagrammatics which is telling you how this works. So let me let me draw the picture. Um, so so the leading order term, we say here's the point um, here's the point x, and then there's so one of these k propagators which connects it to the boundary point x that we integrate over. And then at first order, in one over n, well we still have x here, but then now we have a bulk point x prime here, which is connected by a bulk propagator G, and then there's two K's here, right? There's K and K connecting to big X prime and big X double prime. I guess maybe I should call that prime, didn't I? Yeah, okay. Um, and then you can see now that this process should continue diagrammatically, right? So, you know, if you want to, if you want to just make up another option, right? So, I don't know, maybe this goes here to a bulk point and this bulk point has a loop, and then this uh, sends another bulk propagator here, and then somehow, I don't know, there's two Ks, or I don't know. Yes, I mean, all, you know, we can uh, think of all sorts of diagrams that we could draw. Uh, and so by repeatedly iterating it, you can derive a sort of Feynman rules for constructing this guy to all orders in 1 over n. Uh, yeah, 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 that's right. So just like in Feynman diagrams, I'm always using the free propagator. Uh, now there's two kinds of propag propagators. There's the G's and the K's. And so it would be tempting to call this the bulk to bulk and this to the bulk to boundary propagator, but then Oliver will get confused. So I don't, wanna, I don't wanna call it that. So usually this is called the smearing function. And this, I guess, is just called the space like greens function. Um, yeah. Um, when you wrote that the boundary integral was just a K propagator, could you, I didn't, I think I didn't catch why the other piece doesn't Oh, the L? Um, yeah, so if you look at the R's in the two terms, 
Remember, we're in the regime, so where, um, where so, since we've been discussing m squared, yeah, yeah. Well, I think, yeah. As long, so as long as the, um, no, I think always this delta here is a is a larger number than d minus delta. So, so the d minus delta is the slow falling off part of g. And, and it turns out that to get a non-trivial contribution to this boundary term, you need to use the slow falling piece. It just, it just damps out too fast, and so it doesn't contribute to the boundary term. Yeah. Then why did you write down the fast falling piece? Well, because otherwise the equation wouldn't have been true, I guess. I mean, well, I mean it depends what you, what you mean by the symbol here. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I guess I wrote it down because otherwise someone would complain, and then I'd have to say I didn't write it down because it was subleading. So, okay. If you like. Um, <coughs> yeah. Uh, bulk to bulk, yeah. So if you if you put two of these guys in the bulk and you compute their expectation value, you get the bulk correlator. I mean that's sort of by construction, right? So I mean so I mean well first of all clearly so every maybe just to emphasize this everything on the right hand side of this is a CFT expression, right? So these these G's and K's are just uh, C numbers, right? So the only operators here are these O's, which are CFT operators, right? Um, so and then the the whole point of this is that. Um, so if you compute any correlation function of these fives, right, in the, in the CFT, then this reduces it to a correlation function of the O's, which means that all of the bulk-to-bulk -bulk correlators can be represented in terms of integrals of boundary-to-boundary -boundary correlators, right? But then since we've assumed that the boundary-to-boundary -boundary correlators match those of the bulk CFT with some effective action, it must mean that the, the, phi, the phi phi correlators we compute here agree with those bulk ones. Because we're just kind of inverting the map. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. And you, you, ha you have to be careful about it. Yeah. Yeah, you have, you have to be careful about it, but in Lorenzian signature, I think the I epsilon prescription is going to take care of everything. And, and, we're, in your, and we're in Lorenzian signature. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, the loop I drew there is bad. You're right. Uh, yeah, I guess, I, okay, I was imagining there was another interaction, but fair enough. Um, I guess what I should have done was that. Yeah. Okay, um, so, so let me now make a few comments about this construction. Um, so the first comment, which I already mentioned, but I, I just want to say it again, is that the Cauchy problem, which we solved in constructing this G, is a weird Cauchy problem because of this space-like property of the Green's function. Uh, and I use this hack to construct it in ADS by using the symmetries. So um, it hasn't been proven, proven in general that these space-like Green's functions exist. Now, this construction in some sense gives a formal construction of them in other backgrounds because if you now go to a background other than ADS, then you can interpret that change of background by resumming an infinite series of these diagrams uh, in the same way that if you're studying the hydrogen atom, you can either say you have a proton and electron and they're, act they're interacting via free QED propagators and you have to sum up all these lighter diagrams, or you can say, I have a classical Coulomb field and the electron is moving in it and I use the propagator in the Coulomb background, right? And you, so you can derive the second one from the first one. And so similarly here, you should be able to derive the story in other geometries beyond this one by summing up those diagrams, but in practice that's very difficult. So it would still be nice to have a PDE way of just sort of directly con constructing or at least proving the existence of these Gs in other backgrounds. But, but it's a difficult PDE problem. I asked a mathematician once and he thought it would be very difficult. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to comment on that a sec, so just hold, yeah, just one sec. Yeah. So specifically, how do I put in an arbitrary mass distribution? Sorry, what, mass distribution? Or I don't know, when you say a different background, so how would I really do it? 
Um, well, okay, so the first thing you could do is you could put in a geometry that doesn't require mass to source it, right? So you could put in a gravity wave or something, right? You know, or you could put in some, uh, right? But I mean, then you, then you could, you know, make a classical shell of this phi and create a star or a planet or something, right? And that would source, uh, right? So, I mean, and, and you know, all, all the stuff that the matter would be made out of goes into this, right? So, like, the, this phi is like the standard model, right? You know, it has the proton and the electron and everything else in principle. Um, yeah. Other questions? Yeah? Uh, yeah, I'm going to comment on that later in the talk, so yeah, just hold on. Yeah, that, that's related to the distributional thing I said before. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, okay. So yeah. So that's so it's an interesting PDE problem. I don't know. I, I also asked Yao about it, and he thought said he thought it should be doable. So I don't know. Yeah. Yao's a smart guy. So. Um, all right. So so uh, second comment. So so at higher orders, you see that the operator that appear here sort of becomes more and more non-local from the boundary point of view, right? Like. So this one, it was already non-local because there was an integral in time. So, so you know, if you wanted to express it all at a fixed time, it would be very complicated. And, but here, it's just getting worse and worse, right? And so as we, as we go to higher and higher orders, you know, although these are sort of formal expressions for these operators, right? I mean, if you actually wanted to use them in the CFT, you would have to be a very, you know, to compute numbers, you would have to be a pretty powerful person. Um, OK. Um, so then, uh, good. So now the third comment. So th this construction constructs operators which obey the bulk equations of motion. But there's something a little bit funny because you could say, well, it works for whatever bulk equations of motion I want, right? Like, so say, say I put in like the wrong coefficient g for the phi squared interaction. Or, well, I guess it's phi cubed interaction in Lagrangian. Um, you know, something should go wrong, right? I mean, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, I mean, otherwise it's just fake, right? I mean, I shouldn't be able to just sort of construct this bulk theory, you know, do it to, to obey whatever equations of motion I want, right? So the thing that goes wrong um, is precisely what Jiechang was asking about before, right? Is I, I wrote down the operators here, but I didn't tell you anything about their algebra, their correlation functions. Uh, so in particular, um, Kabat and Lifshitz and Lo showed that um, so, so this G, so I mean, let's think. So how do we know that G anyway, right? So the way we know that G is we look at the three-point function of O, O, O in the CFT. And then when we compare to the bulk, there's a cubic vertex which reproduces that, that, that three-point function. So the OPE coefficient in the CFT, COO, determines this G. So if you put in a g here, which was different than the one that you would have gotten from the three-point function of the o's, then what um, Hamilton, Kabat, and Lischitz, and Lowe, or some subset of them showed, is that then you would find that the operators in the bulk, phi of x, phi of x prime, um, would not commute um, at space-like separation. Uh, so, so in order to actually get the effective field theory to work out correctly in the bulk at the level of the correlation functions, you need to use the right equations of motion. And in higher orders, that will include the Einstein equations. All right. Um, so I want to make one more comment, right? So also at, at higher orders, so s remember yesterday I, I briefly acknowledged that these operators aren't gauge invariant, and then I mumbled some things about dressing and said that that would fix it. So. Uh, when you go to higher orders in the interactions uh, and you start having to deal with the gravitational interactions and any gauge interactions that are around in the bulk, you run into that problem. So you find that if you try to construct these operators as strictly local operators in the bulk, you don't succeed. Uh, because the word identity of O with the stress tensor in the CFT or with the current for any gauge field will not allow you to define operators that obey microcausality. Um, so the operators that you can construct are these operators with lines attached to them. For example, Wilson lines are the gravitational version of Wilson lines. And then the algebra that you get is the right algebra for these non-local operators. Right. So that sort of comes out automatically of this machinery as you go to higher orders. All right. Um, so I, I think that's actually all I wanted to say about this um, what's called global reconstruction. 
So I, I guess I didn't say that word yet, but so, so the reason this is called global reconstruction um, is because the operators that you get have support on, it, on an entire Cauchy surface of the boundary, right? So, so you know, if, if we just pick a time slice here, like say this one, then we can represent everything on that time slice by using the CFT Hamiltonian to move things down to that time slice. But we get an operator which has support everywhere on the slice. So a priori, we know very little about it from the CFT point of view. It's some, some, you know, it's some operator that in principle uses all, the, all of the, you know, the fields at each point in space. Uh, so it sounds a little bit funny, actually, because you know, if you, as you take this point and you move it to the boundary, I mean, we know eventually it's just going to turn into a local operator, right? So eventually, it's only going to involve the degrees of freedom right at this point. But if we move away from that a little bit, now suddenly we ha we're using this stuff that's like way over here, right? And, that, and, and that's a little bit weird, right? I mean, why should, you know, we're so close to the boundary. Why should we have to care, you know, what's going on all the way over here just to represent this operator? Uh, so, so then we might want to try to see if, you know, is there, so remember we already saw there was some non-uniqueness in this representation yesterday, right? Like we saw that we could have the k go from minus pi to pi or go over this space-like thing, right? So, so maybe is it possible that we can use this non-uniqueness to, to shrink the region of the boundary where the support of this operator is, okay? And like basically the next two lectures, we're just going to be doing that and exploring the consequences of that because it turns out that there are a lot of rich things that come out of trying to do that. Um, which, which the, the, the thing I said about the gauge fields or the thing I said about just the correlation functions? Yeah, so, okay, well, ju just think about it in QED, okay? So in QED, if you act with the, if you have an electron operator here, and, uh, well, fermions are confusing, so let's make it scalar QID, QED. So we have phi here. And then, um, so, to, so this is phi of x. So to make it gauge invariant, um, well, there, there are various things you can do, but the simplest thing you can do is you can multiply this by a Wilson line, um, uh, where I guess to get this right, I have to say, uh, I put, put an x here and put infinity here. Um, and then what happens is when you do a gauge transformation, the phase rotates here, but then the Wilson line uh, compensates for it, so you get a gauge invariant operator. But the consequence of that is you have this Wilson line attached to the operator, um, which is running off to infinity. Uh, so in particular, if you, if you compute the commutator of this operator with the electric field, E of y, um, then there's a contribution to this commutator whenever y is on this line. Because the electric field is canonically conjugate to the vector potential. So it means that this guy does not compute, commute with the electric field over here, even though this point and this point are space-like separated. So to really get microcausality, you need the, you know, you need the, well, you need to compute a commutator where all parts of the operators are space-like separated. For example, like I could have this Wilson line and that Wilson line, and those would, those would commute. Yeah. So uh, these operators, the Wilson lines, I think, I think supposed to be only perturbatively involved. Uh, well, sorry, okay, no, 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 the, the statement is different in the two cases. So in electrodynamics or QCD, this one is non-perturbative, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay? Right, yeah. yeah, yeah, but the, uh, everything we're doing is perturbative though, right? So, I mean, we don't think that the bulk theory makes sense non-perturbatively. It's true that these things with the geodesics, there can be some, uh, you know, there can be some topology change or something. I mean, you know, like, yeah, I mean, as you know, there's this paper by Daniel that explains some of this. But, but we're not trying to get, I mean, we're not trying to get things that are e to minus one over g. We're just trying to get order by order in g. Uh, and so the operators are defined at that level. I mean, the, the Euclidean path integral, to some extent, is really only defined perturbatively for gravity, right? So, um. all right. Um, so, so, so now, now we're gonna we're gonna try and now do uh, what's called subregion duality, which uh, basically means to shrink the boundary region. Um. So the reason it's called subregion duality is because you say, okay, say that, say that you're given in the CFT, you have some time slice, and you're given access only to the operators in some subregion of the time slice. Then you ask what region of the bulk 
can you represent the operators in just in that subregion? So it's like saying a subregion is dual to a subregion. Uh, a priori, it shouldn't be true. Uh, so let's start by at least giving one construction where we can see that it is true. So, um, so what I'm going to explain is something called ads rindler reconstruction. Okay, so, so to do that, I first have to tell you what is ads rindler So now we're going to go back and do some more of this uh, coordinate transformations and so on. Uh, so let's first remember that um, ADS we defined as uh, this submanifold uh, um, in... Uh, in uh, D plus two dimensional Min uh, Minkowski space and two zero signature. Um, so, so previously I wrote down some coordinate transformation which turned that uh, into this global metric. Where did I write? I wrote it somewhere, didn't I? Ah, uh, there, yeah, there, there. Yeah, yeah. So previously I gave some coordinate transformation that turned this into R and T and omega. Um, so now I'm going to do a different transformation and then we'll see it, it transforms into something different. Um, so the choice I'll do now instead is I'll define T equals rho cosh chi. Um, T prime is square root of rho squared minus one uh, cinch of tau. Um, XD is square root of rho squared minus uh, one times cosh tau and um, x1 squared plus xd minus 1 squared um, is rho squared cinch squared chi. Okay, so this might look a little bit arbitrary. Um, you can check that if I substitute this in here, I've indeed parameterized this surface, right? So if, you know, if I take t squared plus t prime squared minus these things, then everything conspires. Uh, oh, and I guess I've set L to 1, so let me do it here too. Uh, I guess I don't need to square it then. Um, yeah, you can check that I get something which indeed adds up to minus 1. Um, now let me just, before I, so I'll draw the geometry of this in a sec, but let me first just emphasize. So in, in, the, in the previous coordinates that we did, right, the global coordinates, we said that x1 squared plus xd squared was r squared. That was the definition of r. So that preserved a spherical symmetry that rotated between d of the x's. Here I've only preserved a spherical symmetry that rotates between d minus 1 of the x's. So I've broken some of the spherical symmetry of ADS. So, so this choice is going to pick some sort of direction in terms of that, those spherical coordinates we were, we were discussing before. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it's d minus one dimensional spherical coordinates. Yeah, so it, it's a, uh, no, no, because I, that's why I did all the squares. So, so no, this is this is correct. But now, if I tried to write the equation for any one of these, then you would see the spherical coordinates. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, so, so, so now let me draw. Um, so, oh, so let me write the metric, and then I'll draw it on the other board. So, so uh, if we plug and chug, uh, then this tells us that ds squared is minus rho squared minus 1 d tau squared plus d rho squared over rho squared minus 1 um, plus rho squared d chi squared plus cinch squared chi um, d omega d minus 2 squared. And so here it's the d minus 2 instead of the d minus 1 that we were just discussing. Uh, and then this you can recognize is just the hyperbolic ball, or the, you know, the hyperbolic disk, uh, the higher dimensional version. So this is dh d minus 1 squared. All right? Uh, so let me now send this up here. So now let's draw some pictures and try and understand what we actually did. Um, so, so here's the picture. 
So I'll, again, I'll just draw it for ADS3 because that's the limit of what I can do. Okay, so, so it turns out what we've done so is that um, we've taken this time slice at t equals zero, and we've cut it in half here. Uh, and then there's a wedge like this. Um, so then uh, tau is a time coordinate in this wedge. So up here we have tau equals infinity. Down here we have tau equals minus infinity. Um, then um, rho is a kind of radial kind of coordinate here. So you see that at, at rho equals 1, this kind of looks like a black hole, right? There's some kind of horizon at rho equals 1. And so, so rho equals 1, if you like, is here. But then also it's kind of really this whole null thing here. So the coordinates break down right on that horizon, but it's the same thing you're used to from black holes. And then rho equals infinity is out here. Uh, so that's the boundary out here. So then the rho coordinate kind of starts at the horizon at rho equals 1 and then kind of moves out to the boundary at rho equals infinity. And then this hyperbolic thing, well, so in ADS3, the, um, so then D is 2, so this is 1. So the one-dimensional hyperbolic plane is pretty boring. It's just the infinite line. Uh, and so that infinite line is just this one here. So it's kind of like the spatial direction at the boundary. So, so, so then the, the boundary here is R times H D minus 1. Uh, and the R here is the time. The H D minus 1 is this direction. Um, so, so this is, if you like, this is the ADS version of Rindler space, which if you don't know about, you should learn about. One place you can learn about it is in my Jerusalem lectures. Um, so, so, so this is a subregion of ADS, right? These coordinates just cover the interior of this wedge. And then this choice we made of picking out XD to be special is the choice that, that told us where the wedge was. So if we change that, then we would move this around. And that's that, that's that extra part of the spherical symmetry that we broke. What are we doing here? OK. Nine till, till 10.15, right? Yeah, OK. Um, so let's now think about um, a scalar field in the, in the Rindler wedge. So a scalar field in the Rindler wedge, well, we can do the same thing that we did before, right? We can expand. Um, so so let, let's do the free scalar. Right, so, 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 so we, we again look for a complete set of solutions of the wave equation in this wedge. So we try to find a basis of solutions, which I'll call f omega lambda. Um, uh, yeah, I think it's good. So that's going to be uh, e to the minus i omega tau. So we still have the tau translation symmetry, so it still is good to expand in terms of e to the i tau, e to the minus i omega tau. Um, we have, again, a, a radial wave function, psi omega lambda of rho. Um, and then now we have what might be called hyperbolic spherical harmonics, uh, which uh, I'll just label by this eigenvalue lambda. So lambda was something like L and M before, but now it might have continuous uh, parameters in it because it's the, it's the Laplacian on the hyperbolic plane, which is non-compact. Uh, and so th then this depends on what I'll call, uh, I'll just call alpha the coordinates on the hyperbolic plane. All right. Uh, so we can go through the same analysis that we did before, right? So there's a radial wave equation that we need to solve. Um, there are boundary conditions. And so when we choose the standard quantization, we find that this guy goes like n omega lambda times rho to the minus delta, where delta is the same thing that we had before. Um, but now there's a new thing which happens, which was that previously we... Um, you know, since we were previously doing the sphere, we we'd had to demand that things were non-singular in the center. 
But here we don't have that constraint because the the singular the center is not degener is not you know collapsing to a point anymore. Um, so there's no additional criterion at the horizon. We just allow whatever we want to happen there. And that means that omega will no longer be quantized. Omega is now going to be continuous. There will be continuous frequencies. And, and this, again, you should be familiar with from Rindler space or from the Schwarzschild geometry where the same thing is true. So the frequencies uh, of, the wave, of the wave equation outside of a black hole are continuous, uh, at least in quantum field theory. We think in quantum gravity, you know, in non-perturbative quantum gravity, they're exponentially finely spaced. But that's, uh, we're not doing that yet here. Um, OK, so that means that we can write phi of x when x is sitting inside of this wedge um, as, well, now we've got an integral over omega since it's continuous from 0 to infinity. Um, f, oh, sorry, I forgot. Uh, then, OK, I'll write it as a sum over lambda, but secretly there are integrals in there too. Um, and then uh, we have f omega lambda of rho tau alpha. And then again, we have an annihilation operator, a omega lambda. Uh, and then we have the Hermitian conjugate. Okay, So just same story as before. But now we can again use the extrapolate dictionary. right? So, so, so far, we're just doing bulk physics here. But now we want to, again, get a CFT representation of this A. But it's, gonna, it's, the same, it's basically the same as before, right? So at large rho, right, then this, this guy just behaves like that. We strip off the rho to the delta by this multiplication in the extrapolate dictionary. Um, so then we again find that um, O of omega and lambda, the Fourier transform of the CFT operator, um, is equal to this n omega lambda times A omega lambda. So, so then we can represent the creation op or the annihilation operator here just in terms of this operator O of omega and lambda, which now I want to remind you is since it's the Fourier transform of O just against functions with support in this region is an operator with support only in this region, which means that we've now succeeded in representing any bulk field inside of this wedge in terms of CFT operators with support only on the boundary of the wedge. So in particular, we're not using any of the operators over here. So we've now decreased the spatial support of our CFT representation of this operator. But now with the restriction that the operator has to be in this wedge, uh, which before we didn't have. Um, so as before, we can try to go back to position space. So we can try to write this saying that phi of x uh, for x inside of this wedge um, is equal to some integral dx prime over the boundary of the wedge, some kernel k of little x, big x prime, o of big x prime, um, plus interactions that we work out in the same way. Uh, and we can again write a formula for this in terms of, in terms of these modes. Uh, but I won't go through it since it's just the same as before. Um, so that looks pretty good. Um, there are a few subtleties, though, that I want to comment on. So the first is that um, this k doesn't really exist. So that's what one of the questions was getting at before. So you can write this k. You can write a formula for it in terms of a mode sum over these f's. Uh, but um, if you try to evaluate the sum for generic points x and x prime, you find it's divergent. So, so this, as a number, doesn't exist. But um, there's a nice paper by Ian Morrison uh, explaining that if you instead think of this k as a distribution, which probably you heard about at some point in your quantum mechanics class. It's a sort of a function on functions. Uh, so you say then this doesn't, it doesn't make sense as a function, but it makes sense once I integrate it against something else. Uh, then there's a nice story, and you can show that basically the, 
the distribution that you get with the sum has just the right properties so that whenever you integrate it against a CFT operator, which is a causal operator, uh, then it's always finite. So, you know, we could have more fun thinking about that, but I think it's, it's best to just now, having acknowledged that, to forget about it, since the, the ultimate conclusion is the same, which is that this has a representation just in terms of the operators here. And if you want, you can just go to momentum space, and then there's not this, you don't have this distributional issue. All right, so, th so that's uh, one subtlety. Now let me make a few more um, positive comments. Um, so first of all, um, well, let me stop and ask if there are questions first. Yeah. Um, well, I think, so it's, you know, the, the, roughly speaking, the Rindler wedge has its own nice sort of globally hyperbolic uh, property, you know, that, that, I mean, sorry, well, Actually, okay, no, I think, I, l let me say something I'm going to say in a few minutes, and I think it'll satisfy you. Yeah, let, let me just say it that way. Um, any any other questions? Yeah. What you sort of implied in this, uh, there's a sense in which everybody would use the freedom we have to choose the local reconstruction region. Yeah. Yeah, so I didn't organize things that way because it was easier to do it this way, but we could also show that the relationship between these two guys is again comes from that freedom. Uh, not directly. There are examples where you can compute that explicitly and see that it's true. Um, yeah. But, 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 but apparently it must be true because I derived this and I derived that, and so the only thing they can differ by is something that integrates to zero against O. Um, and we know what those things are. Okay, um, good. So, so let me first comment. Um, so again, by, by using the CFT evolution, right, so S, right, so, so if we take the boundary of that wedge, so let's, let's unwrap the boundary now, the, the boundary of the space, and then there's this diamond here. That, I mean, this, this, uh, this boundary region here, uh, uh, when we unwrap it, it becomes a diamond here with, with null edges. Um, uh, so in particular, by using the CFT evolution, we can take the operators at various times and collapse them all down uh, to t equals zero uh, and get a representation of the operator which just uses the degrees of freedom on this, on this subregion of the spatial slice here. Okay, so, so uh, in the future, I'll, I'll talk about it. I'll, I'll, I'll always interpret this operator as, I'll just describe it as having support here. And this is, this is what I did when I, when I said that. Again, though, at the cost of making it look even more non-local. Um, so now, um, let me say, getting at the, the question that was just asked. Um, so, so by using conformal symmetry, um, we can move the wedge around and we can make it bigger and smaller. So, uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so, well, let me just make a general comment. So, so, so say we're doing quantum field theory, uh, and, and we have a Heisenberg operator here, phi, which is equal to phi of zero, e to the minus i h t, um, e to the i h t. So at time t, this is a local operator. It's quite simple. But if we try to represent, but if we instead try to represent this operator in terms of, you know, phi and phi dot and things here, it will be very complicated. So what will happen is this, you, you can try to evolve it back in time and it'll spread uh, in the past light cone. But then in an interacting theory, you'll get some very complicated mess here, you know, which uh, you, you have to solve the theory in some very deep sense to be able to say what that mess is explicitly. Um, in free theory, you can work it out. It's uh, it's non-local, but it's only it's not very non-local. Um, okay, um, good. So so conformal symmetry lets us now. So let's just draw it from above. So it lets us take. So this is now this time slice. This circle here is that that t equals zero slice, right? So we started here. We cut it in half. But by doing a conformal transformation, right? So so here was the wedge. We can we can send it wherever we want. So for example, we can we can just put it up here. Uh, 
you know, or we could put it, you know, um, over here. Uh, so the general statement is that if you look at, so if you ask in general, what is this, what is the intersection of the boundary of this with the t equals zero slice? It's going to be um, a ball. So, right, so, so in this picture, it's just, uh, so if we think, so this slice here is a sphere. It's a circle because we're in, in, in d equals two, but it, in higher dimension, this is a ball. And then this is like the equator, these two points. So this, if you like, is the eastern hemisphere. Um, right, so the intersection of the boundary of the wedge with the t equals zero slice of the boundary is the eastern hemisphere of the t equals zero slice of the boundary. I think I, think, I, think I said all that correctly. Um, so then by doing conformal transformations, I won't change the fact that it's a ball, but I can make the ball bigger and smaller. So, so, if we, so if we think in higher dimensions, right, so like here, so say here's the, this sphere now represents the t equals zero slice, so now I guess I'm doing CFT3, right? So, so previously, you know, say we had, you know, the southern hemisphere or something. By doing a conformal transformation, I can move it to a disk of any size, uh, but it has to be a disk. I can't change it, change it from being a disk. Um, so then this statement must be true for any, it's called ball-shaped region in the boundary. For any ball-shaped region in the boundary, no matter how big or how small, there's a wedge, which I can define in the bulk, uh, and everything which is inside of that wedge can be represented with support just in that ball. So in particular now, um, if we have an operator which is near the boundary, like say this one over here, then we can just choose the ball to be like that, and now we can represent it right there. So then you see this kind of more continuously matches onto the extrapolate dictionary. As the operator gets closer to the boundary, I can put it in the wedge of a smaller and smaller ball, and so then the support of this representation gets smaller and smaller. Um, okay. Doing well. Um, so any questions about that? That's very important, so I want that to be clear to everyone. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so well, uh, let me just, let me say the next thing I was going to say, and then I'm going to address precisely that. Yeah, so yes? Yeah, so that also gets smaller, right? So the conformal symmetry extends into the ADS isometries in the bulk. So if we draw the picture, like let's, let's draw it here. Um, so say, say I do one of those conformal transformations where now the ball is just, I don't know, it's just here, right? So then the wedge will just look like this. Maybe I should make it a little bigger. Um, <laughs> okay, here's my ball, and then the wedge is like that. So it's a smaller bulk region. Uh, I think I, I'm going to answer that for you in a sec. I mean, right now it's just the conformal transformation of that region, but we'll, I'll describe it a little more explicitly in a sec. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let me now maybe I'll just maybe I'll just go here because there's a little bit more to say. Um, so now let me give a sort of more uh, covariant characterization of this situation. Um, so, um, okay, so, so I'm going to give a definition. So say sigma is a boundary um, Cauchy slice, um, for example, the t equals zero uh, slice of the boundary, but could be some other uh, other Cauchy slice, um, and um, R um, is a spatial subregion. So any subregion will be spatial. I'm spatial. I'm just saying that to emphasize it, because because sigma is spatial. Um, so then, um, let me think of how to say this. So I, I'm going to make two definitions. 
Uh, but first, I'm going to find a bigger piece of chalk. Okay. So, okay. So the first definition. Um, so um, the domain of dependence of R. Uh, let's maybe I, to emphasize, I'll call it the boundary. Uh, is the boundary domain of dependence of R. Um, so this is sometimes called the causal diamond of R. But so let me draw, let me draw a picture. So here's sigma, and here's R. So the domain of dependence is defined as the set of points uh, in in the, in the space time. So here the space time being the boundary, um, such that every time like curve which passes through uh, a point in that region. Uh, if you extend it in a time-like manner, it must also pass through R. So, so it looks like this. It's this. It's actually this diamond that I was drawing before. So let, let's see if we can unpack that, right? So, so, so say, say I have this point over here. It's not in the diamond, right? Well, then th that's because there's a time-like curve like this, which doesn't intersect R. Uh, in fact, up here that's also true, right? Because here, here's a time-like curve that doesn't intersect R. But for the points in here, any time-like curve you draw, unless you just stop it, you know, it, you, it's, you know, it, it, it's always eventually going to going to intersect R. Uh, so that's the sort of relativist definition of the domain of dependence. Okay. Oh, uh, I don't know. Nor I know. I neither know nor care. Yeah. Yeah, that's the same question. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I guess maybe I want this to be an open set, but I mean we're, we're integrating stuff over this, so we don't care whether the boundary is included or not. It's measure zero. Um, yeah, I don't know. Go look in Wald and then tell me. You, you might actually know. Actually, I don't know. I thought it was causal. Right? Okay, fine. Causal. He, he's a, he probably knows, so I, I defer. Uh, <laughs> um, okay. Uh, good. So then, and, and you can make the same complaint in the next definition, and I'll make the same response. So. <laughs> Um, so then, good. So then, now finally, um, we define uh, the causal wedge. So now the, so that's definition number one. Definition number two is that uh, C of R, which is the causal wedge of R, um, is defined as the intersection of the bulk past and future of D of R. Um, so I want to emphasize this is the bulk. And this is the bulk. Um, so let's think about that from the point of view of this picture, right? So, so D of R is this boundary diamond. And then the future of that is kind of all these points up here, right? That points that can receive signals from D of R. The past of D of R in the bulk is kind of all of these points, which can send signals to D of R. So their intersection will be this wedge kind of thing. And in fact, for, 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 the, for the ball shape region, it is this wedge. <coughs> okay? So, so, so in the special case where we take R to be a ball shaped region in ADS, uh, then it, this is just the ADS in their wedge, but this is a more general definition. Okay, so um, then we can reinterpret what we saw over here as saying that um, given a boundary region R, any bulk operator which is in the causal wedge of R can be represented as an operator with support in the CFT only in R. Okay, so sometimes you can say that this suggests maybe that, that R is somehow dual to C of R. So I put that question mark for two reasons. One is that we only establish this for ball-shaped regions uh, and not for general regions. Okay, and that again goes back to this question of the PDE solving the PDEs. So I believe that it's true for an arbitrary region R and its causal wedge, and I think probably most people do, but it has not been proven. So if you like PDEs or you have a friend who likes PDEs, and well, you have to like. 
you know, whatever non-elliptic slash hyperbolic PDEs uh, and uh, distributions, so it's non-trivial. But if you like that, uh, then you could try to prove this. But then I also put a question mark because of something for an, for an additional reason, which is that I showed you that um, if I have an operator here, which is in the causal wedge, uh, I can represent it in the boundary. But it could be that there are things that are outside the causal wedge, which also can be represented in the region R, right? I didn't, I didn't show you that that's not possible. I just showed you that this was possible. Uh, and in fact, we'll see that in general, this is not true. There is a larger wedge, which is called the entanglement wedge of R, where you can still represent um, the operators in the region R. Uh, we probably won't get to that until the last lecture, but it's very important because, um, well, okay, I'll say in the last lecture why it's very important. Um, okay, so I think uh, we're basically out of time, so I think I'm done, and uh, we can uh, stop and ask for questions. Thanks. They're all tired already, huh? Maybe coffee for a Um, yeah, that's true. So if you look, if you look at this function k, it kind of, you know, it, it it it's larger when x and when these two are near each other. So it's true that the support over here is kind of smaller than the support over here, but it's not zero. I mean, it's you know still formally order one. So, you know, if you just sort of brutally remove this part and keep that part, you'll get the wrong answer. So so you have to do something more subtle, like along the lines of this. Uh, Yeah. 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 What? Okay. Yeah. Why don't you hold that thought? Because the tomorrow we're going to discuss that at great length. No, it's the same story. I, we're, we're doing the same thing. We're solving. I mean, let me emphasize. Let me emphasize this from the bulk point of view. These two things are totally equivalent. This is what's called a Bogolubov transformation. So when you're doing free field theory, you can expand the field in whatever modes you want. So in particular, um, so if you wanted to do, uh, you know, so field here. So there's a complete set of modes of this kind for the global problem. Half of them are in this wedge, and half of them are in its complement. So something which is in this wedge, you can represent using only these modes. Something in the complement wedge, you can represent using only the other modes. And something up here, you need to use both. Okay? And once you have that full set of modes, there's just a linear transformation that relates those modes um, to the modes that we were using here in the global picture. And so the operators are just totally equivalent. Um, there's, there's really no uh, subtlety in their equivalence from the bulk point of view. Uh, it, only, it, it gets more subtle when you try to think about it from the point of view of the boundary, which I think is what you're getting at, but we're, we're going to talk about that a lot tomorrow. Um, yeah? Is there some obvious reason why the regular uh, HKL clearing function is an actual function and not a distribution? Yeah, um, well, I can give you an answer to that question in the other direction. So I, I can give you an argument that the Rindler one couldn't have been a regular function. So there's a nice argument, which maybe I can give you during the coffee break, that shows that. But uh, yeah, as far as the global one, um, yeah, I don't know. Um, well, the only thing I can say, yeah, I guess th the best thing I can say is that since I could construct G as a function by the symmetry argument that I made, then, I'm, then I can extract K by doing this. Whereas for Rindler, there, there's, there wasn't a symmetry argument like that, uh, that I could make like a Rindler space like Green's function. Uh, yeah, and, and that's also, incidentally, that's also related to the question of how do we extend the Rindler story to interactions at higher orders. 
So I, I think it's not a, a principled problem because you can just use this momentum space picture and do everything. But it, but it, you know, in practice, it means that this nice story I told doesn't quite go through. Yeah. I mean, I think there may be some sort of distributional space like Green's function in Rindler space, and I, I think it would be a fun project to to, to construct it in some way. But I, I currently don't know how to do it. Let's take a break and come back to Twitter too.